Hendrik Goltzius, who was widely known as a brilliant engraver, in 1608 painted a large painting, Adam and Eve. He began to paint only at the age of 40, but soon became the most important artist of the Harlem School. After the War for Independence, Holland became the first bourgeois republic, the wealthiest and most advanced state in Europe. The Dutch were very proud of the right they won to be the omnipotent owners of their country. This was reflected directly and indirectly in the art of their time. This master was one of the most notable artists in the Academy of Harlem. He displayed outstanding skill as an engraver and draftsman, and did not turn to painting until the age of 43. This Hermitage picture from his hand, Adam and Eve, ranks as the most important in his pictorial work. The banks of the frozen canal are full of animated life. We see many citizens that quite naturally walk along the canal and enjoy skating and driving on a sledge or enter the stalls to drink a glass of beer. The composition of the Hermitage painting Winter Landscape Near the Hague by Jan van Goyen is as natural as life itself. In the 17th century Artists still worked in their studios while making only drawings from nature. In the picture by Jan van Goyen, we almost feel the coolness of the transparent and luminous ice and the humidity of atmosphere, thanks to which the color palette became blurred. The modest and non-spectacular Dutch countryside attracted many landscape painters. With its so familiar motifs, such moving paintings were inspired as Seascape by Jan Porcellus, View near Harlem by Philips Vorman, and Landscape with Mill by Ert van der Neer. They represented the flat countryside with misty distance and abundance of water, which is so characteristic of Holland. Mills were necessary to drain the lands won from the sea. The Dutch loved to repeat that God created the sea, and the Dutch created the soil. The whole of surrounding nature, where earth and sky were brought together, was penetrated with a sensible air. The aerial perspective was to be the major achievement of the Dutch painters. Adrian van Osted was attracted to representing individual features of peasants' appearance and behavior, as well as those of farmhouses and country life. The scene he depicted in the painting Village Musicians was not his own invention, as home concerts as well as amateur theater were very popular in Holland. Jan Sten, who was a very talented pupil of Osted, frequented theater performances and often acted as a participant. He took his themes from theater pieces and often made himself a hero, playing any chosen role. He represented, in his funny painting, The Idlers, himself and his wife, Marguerite van Goyen, she was a daughter of the renowned landscape painter, as a happy-go-lucky rake accompanied by a woman friend. Kitchen things round them emphasize this joyful play. Another imagery, full of love of order and cleanliness, can be seen in the painting by Peter Janssen's Elingua, House Room in Holland, where the young woman is represented at the moment of sweeping the floor. 
the shafts of light having penetrated into this room, fill it with expressive and harmonious play between warm reflections and transparent, slightly blurred shadows, turning the enclosed interior space with its numerous rectangular forms into a miraculously luminous crystal. Domestic interiors and courtyards, with their ordinary everyday life, became especially popular from the middle of the 17th century. An excellent embodiment of the idea of order is represented by a hostess in the painting A Mistress and a Housemaid by Pieter de Hoek. In fact, the chief personages of this picture are to be considered silence and peace, which create a particular atmosphere imbued with almost musical harmony. Human beings and their familiar surrounding entourage are in full consonance, and the picture becomes a kind of window onto the blessed world of prosperity and order. In the still life piece from the hand of Wilhelm Klaas Hedda, lunch with crab, we can see no decorative effects, because the Dutch preferred the intimate world of familiar things. The source of such a widespread motif of Dutch still life painting as lunch food was Harlem. Glass goblets and metalware with remnants of lunch form a natural group, evoking an acute sense of time, as if their owner touched and held them scarcely a minute ago. This disorder is absolutely intentional, for the painter compared different materials, forms, and surface textures, and made them encounter each other. The combining role was played by the unifying silver and olive green palette. The painting often became a kind of visual story from the life of things. The gilded goblet from Augsburg in the painting Dessert by Wilhelm Kalf placed in the center of composition, stands like a fairy tale knight. A little behind him, like an accompanying sword bearer, stands the tall, restrained goblet, which was called by the Dutch Stangenglas. In the foreground, like ambassadors from a far and exotic land, there are fruits that are talking with a fat Dutchman, a paunchy glass, which was called Remer. Things can thus lead their own life playing out theater-like ceremonies, various conversations, and being in harmonious or dramatic relations to each other. This artist worked in Utrecht, the old Catholic center in Holland, and carried on the tradition of Caravaggio in the Dutch school of painting. One can see the influence of the Italian master in the type of composition, the spotlight effect, as well as in the motif itself. This scene of playing music nevertheless reveals, in the treatment of images, the punctuated faithfulness characteristic of Dutch artists. This painter from Harlem was famous, first of all, for his battle scenes and representation of horses. The Hermitage painting shows him also as a talented landscape artist. Few artists could rival Wouverman in expressiveness when he turned to such a characteristically Dutch motif as the permanently changing sky covered with rushing clouds. Jan van Goyen ranks as one of the founders of Dutch tonal landscape painting. 
his paintings impress with their faithful evocation of the soft atmospheric effects characteristic of this seashore country. The painter used uniting silver-gray or brown tones. His color scheme, with close shading, evokes a miraculous feeling of the entity of the whole nature of the world. Caff had no rivals in the ability to translate the prosaic language of material objects into poetics of painting. A riot of color is conjoined in his fruit pieces with an abundance of gifts of nature and sumptuous objects of layout. These became very popular in the everyday practice of the rich bourgeois class in the second half of the 17th century. The painting by a renowned artist of the early 17th century, known also as a teacher of Rembrandt, was bought for the Hermitage under Paul I, but in 1854 it was sold at auction and until 1938 was outside the collection. The painter drew his subject from the Bible, having taken from the Old Testament the story of Abraham who brought the Israelites to the fertile land of Canaan. Miris was famous for his delicate brushwork and enamel smooth finish. All the details in his paintings were embellished with brilliant precision. He became renowned during his lifetime in Holland as well as abroad. This master worked in the mid-17th century and introduced new pictorial effects to Dutch landscape painting, those of intense moonlight. Being a subtle colorist, he loved to render the complicated natural states of light, night, sunset, or sunrise effects. We see here the vast room of a country house where the last preparations for a house concert are coming to an end. The artists act as a wandering fiddler and the inhabitants of the house, the hostess as a singer and the host as a violinist or cellist. The spectators, village children, have already taken their places at the windows. In Porcellus' work, the genre of seascape received purely Dutch features. He treated seascapes as a combination of two elements, the sky and the sea, conjoining them by means of silver-gray tones. The ships are represented only to enhance the impression of mobility of the atmosphere and the water surface.
Potter was drawn to represent individual features of animals' appearance and behavior. This painting could be thought of as a heroic portrait. The silhouette of this village dog against the light sky stands out imposingly, as if it was a monumental image. The painter himself seemed to delight in the pure country air, the warm rays of the evening sun which floods the farmyard crowded with its inhabitants, the people in their everyday activity, and numerous domestic animals. The composition is crowded with details, but they don't disturb our perception of the scene. Within the aerial milieu, permeated throughout with diffused light, all the details form an excellent pictorial ensemble, with some more intense color spots on figures of rude idlers. The artist obviously turned here to such an everyday event as a meeting in the house of a procuress, which became a popular motif in the Dutch art of that time. The Russian art critic of the early 20th century, Alexander Benoit, described this scene merely as an anecdote about a young lady who feels herself not well, while her admirer prepares lemonade in order to cure her under the intense surveillance of her venerable mother. This seemingly accidental arrangement of objects is imbued with a perfect sense of artistic moderation. Hayda's still life pieces expose different principles of contrast, contrasting materials, textures, forms, and outlines. The individuality of each participant is thus accentuated, while the exquisite silver-olive range of colors appears as a principle of harmonious unity. Dutch painters often turned to this subject, which was not considered canonical. Hanthorst, one of the most ardent followers of Caravaggio in Holland, became especially popular for his night scenes. He was known even in Italy, where he was called Gerardo della Notte. This painting seems to be a window opening onto a world of order and prosperity. The art has created a harmonious coexistence of the people and their environment. We can see a terrace with the figures of two women, the brick pavement of a small courtyard behind them, a key viewed through the arch, and the space itself becomes the embodiment of the unhurried rhythm of this life within a clear, determined frame.
From the mid-17th century, domestic interiors, with their everyday life, became especially popular in the school of Delft. Elingua's painting ranks as one of the best of this type. This room looks cheerful and fresh thanks to the shafts of light on the floor and the consonant play between warm reflections and transparent shadows. The Latin words, memento mori, seemingly penetrated the very essence of many Dutch paintings. The artists could not refuse to question their own and viewers' consciousness about the possible and dangerous inner spiritual stagnation, hidden under a superficial layer of material stability and bourgeois self-satisfaction. This subject of the late portrait from the hand of Franz Hals looks at us with bitter irony and even bold scorn. In the 18th century, it was supposed that in this portrait of a man, the artist had made a self-portrait. Perhaps he knew or conjectured who would be the expected viewer of this painting in addressing him with such an unattractive look, and probably had some grounds for it. Holland had a leading position in trade, and the Dutch merchants, having achieved wealth, gradually turned from the selfless warriors of the war for independence into self-satisfied inhabitants with narrow views and peremptory judgments of everything in the world. Franz Hals knew life in Holland and learned to understand the transience of earthly happiness and worldly prosperity. Hals was especially capable of catching the fleeting facial expression or gesture and his dazzling pictorial manner reflected the same acute sense of time which is destined to run away. The ruined edifice, dead tree, or the sailboat perishing in the stormy sea, these were motifs of the implacability of time. This theme attracted artists of different epochs, and Dutch painting could saturate the subject with new and penetrating emotions. We often meet a dead tree in the painting of Jacob Isaacs Ruisdael, whom more than a century later, the great German poet Goethe called philosopher and poet. In one of his masterpieces, The Marsh, a broken birch trunk is in the process of slowly but implacably being swamped by a quagmire symbolizing death. Mighty old trees are still full of forces, but the same destiny is prepared for them, too. Riesdale, with his strong, melancholic temper, questioned his contemporaries with great insistence. But it was obviously a voice crying in the wilderness. Old Howells died in extreme poverty without any sum left for his own burial. Oristel spent his last days in the almshouse. The first impression this painting suggests, beyond the sublime beauty of nature, is the feeling of its grandiose force of living. But the more the spectator looks at this landscape, the more he understands that, even over this power, transient time dominates, which is able to smash this powerful and seemingly eternal harmony. Hulse's dashing sitter, with his bold look, was originally painted with a cocked hat. 
In the gallant 18th century, such a detail in the costume presumably irritated the owner of this painting, which is why the hat was painted over. In 1634, Rembrandt Harmens van Rijn married Saskia van Uhlenborg, who brought him a considerable dowry as well as good connections. There are many portraits of Saskia, painted, drawn, and etched, in which she was often treated as some mythological image. As we can see in the Hermitage painting, Saskia as Flora, painted soon after the marriage. Rembrandt's early works feature fine, smooth brushwork. The viewer's eye is attracted by the noble textural play of silk, the colorful accords of flowers, the fiery luminosity of light. In this sumptuous costume, Saskia's appearance is still very natural and charming, and she seems to feel a little confused about the role she should play before the viewers. It was the painting, The Return of the Prodigal Son, in which Rembrandt made an attempt to sum up the experience of his life as a man and of his way as an artist. In the 1630s, on the portrait with Saskia, he represented himself once in a mood of blatant opulence. And now we see the end of his story. He obviously felt himself as the prodigal son who at the price of sufferings and spiritual enlightenments came to the understanding of his earthly predestination and the sources of spiritual life. We see a man who reached his aim, poor, emaciated, tired, but endowed finally with the warm and blessed light of love and absolution. And suddenly the infinite inner perspective sweeps open in our mind because we comprehend that we are not external and accidental witnesses of this perfectly natural family scene, but direct participants in it. For it is mankind prostrating itself before God the Father. Rembrandt loved to fantasize when portraying people close to him. He often turned to mythology for parallels and used fantastic costumes of his own invention. He represented his young wife twice in the appearance of the ancient goddess Flora, for in his consciousness she embodied flourishing and fertile nature. This character, taken by Rembrandt from mythology, took on the appearance of an earthly woman depicted at the moment of eager expectation of her lover's coming. A sumptuous bridal bed is represented as a precious frame round her nude body, not exquisitely beautiful, but carnal and sensuously living, while the light coming forward from the depths forms a miraculous, luminous aura, which is to be perceived as a presage of Zeus's arrival.
This small-scale picture on a biblical theme was bought in Holland for Emperor Peter I. Figures of two friends depicted in a farewell embrace are enveloped in a golden-blue haze. The pictorial space, penetrated with light and darkness, seems to be imbued with tenderness and sorrow. This seemingly serene landscape is penetrated with inner tension. Having represented the countryside after rain as the storm retreats before a flood of sunlight, Rembrandt imparted an ethical meaning to this view, which embodies here the moment of victory of light over darkness. Rembrandt was an ingenious and versatile draftsman. In his graphic work, pen and brush, thin colored wash, expressiveness of lines and of tonal colored patches were often combined. He thus achieved excellent spaciousness and actuality of the aerial environment. Light was rendered by Rembrandt not only as a physical phenomenon, but also as a spiritual essence. In this domestic interior scene, light embodies life, love, and wisdom. In its flood, the angels are soaring, while its luminosity lightens the cradle with the child. Mary's face and the opened pages of a Bible. Fire symbolizes home. This etching was appreciated so highly by Rembrandt's contemporaries that its second title still holds Sheet at a Hundred Guilders in etchings as in painting. The master found new, more complicated ways to render the substances of light and darkness in their struggle and intertwining. He comprehended this struggle as a reflection of the perennial dramatic fight between good and evil in the world of people. Late portraits from Rembrandt's hand were called portrait biographies, for they concentrate an immense range of sitters' thoughts and emotions, suggesting the presence of their whole life. It seems that a flood of innumerable memories goes through the mind of the old man who sits in the armchair immobile, with tired hands fallen on his knees. This image is wonderful in its dramatic tension. The impasto layers, 
form relief spots, modeling the face and the hands of the sitter so perfectly that they seem to stand out from the darkness. They are depicted as testimonies of the ruthless coercion of implacable time. We see a man who reached his aim, poor, emaciated, tired, but endowed finally with the warm and blessed light of love and absolution. Suddenly the infinite inner perspective sweeps open in our mind because we comprehend that we are not external and accidental witnesses of this perfectly natural family scene, but direct participants in it, for it is mankind prostrating itself before God the Father.